Hello everybody and welcome. Uh, this is the uh, third of my short videos uh, introducing the ideas of Marx and Marxism and today I'm going to talk about the concept of class. Class is probably the concept most associated with Marx. After all, the uh, opening line of the Communist Manifesto reads, uh, the history of all hitherto existing society uh, is the history of class struggle. Um, at the same time, a class is also a familiar concept in everyday language and in the media. But the way it's used in everyday discourse and in the media is, I think, often confused and confusing. And I don't think that's an accident. I think it's very much to the advantage of the status quo and our rulers uh, that um, people should not have a clear idea of their class position and particularly of their class interests. A um, good example of this is what has been done for a long time in the United States, which is to refer to uh, ordinary working class people as the middle class. Uh, and this is a big gain for the uh, powers that be in America and for the status quo, because it makes out that there is, there is no working class in America, just a middle class and then the uh, uh, an underclass. Now, um, I'm going to try in this talk to unravel some of this from a Marxist point of view. Uh, um, one of the meanings most commonly attributed to class is that it is primarily a matter of inherited privilege and of the background that you came from. Uh, in other words, it is the class that your parents came from. Uh, now, there are two, I think, major problems with this. Um, the first is that if your class position is determined by that of your parents, what determines the position of your parents? Uh, and what deter if you say if we say it's what their parents were, then we get an infinite regress that keeps going backwards uh, uh, and provides in the end no explanation and also acts as if class was unchanging and fixed and nobody ever changed their class position, which is patently not true. Uh, and um, another problem with this, it put the same problem really put concretely, is if a person from a working class background as happens, occasionally, not often, but does happen occasionally, rises to be, say, the CEO of a big corporation, are they still working class? They might like to think they are. Or are they now capitalists? Now, a Marxist would answer that they are in fact capitalists, and I think that's by far the most realistic answer because that is actually how they will behave. The position that they're in will force them to behave that because class is not just about your um, uh, class background. It's about the actual position that you occupy in the uh, relations of production in, in society. Another example that I think uh, makes that clear is the question of the United States again. Um, those people who see class as basically about inherited privilege that often associate it with uh, the existence of uh, um, a hereditary aristocracy. And then from that, because the United States for historical reasons doesn't have an inherit. Uh, a, a hereditary aristocracy. They describe the United States as a classless society. But I would say, and Marxists would say, that the United States is a deeply divided class society. And not just because it's got uh, lots of inequality, which it does have massive inequality, but not just because of that. It goes more further than that, because um, for Marxists, class is, n is not just about unequal opportunities, unequal income, unequal distribution of wealth, and so on. Uh, class is about antagonistic positions in the relations of production in society. That's the root of the matter. All the rest, it's not, they're not important, but all the rest are effects of that fundamental fact. Now, um, if we look at this, so we're saying, Marx is saying that uh, Class is based, and class divisions are based, in the social relations of production that people enter into in producing and working, in making and creating the necessities of life. That's where it starts. Now, this has two aspects to it. 
first, that in class divided societies, there is a division between those who own and control the means of production, right, and those who, because they don't own and control the means of production, have to do the work uh, for those who do. And secondly, that this relationship between the owners and controllers and those who perform the work uh, is not just one of inequality, but also one of exploitation. The former group, the owners and controllers, use their position to make their wealth from uh, a surplus that they extract from the labour uh, of those who are working for them. This is most important because this is, means that uh, class divisions are not simply a matter of one group having more than another, and the other group may be resenting it and so on. They are about an actual conflict of interest that goes on uh, every day that is continuous. There is a conflict of interest between exploiter and exploited. The exploiter wants to exploit people more, the exploiter the exploited resist that exploitation and therefore there is class struggle. That's what lies behind Marx's statement that history is the history of class struggle. Now, um, next point here that has to be stressed is that class uh, is not a fixed, eternal or ahistorical phenomenon. It hasn't always existed. It developed historically. Uh, for hundreds of thousands of years, our early ancestors lived in societies that were not divided into classes. It's very important, by the way, for people who think class divisions are a matter of human nature. Not so. Uh, during this period, people were um, hunters and gatherers living in small clans uh, who worked uh, collectively to hunt and gather their food and who shared their food uh, among the clan. Right? There was neither private property uh, in the means of production, nor uh, was there a fixed division between a layer that were rich and a layer that were poor, between exploiters and exploited. This only changed, it changed gradually, but it only changed between 10 and 5,000 years ago uh, with the development of agriculture and cities and uh, the creation of a social surplus, which a minority could gain, and the emergence of private property. Now, since then, we have lived in class-divided societies in most of the world, not everywhere. Some classless societies, like in the uh, Amazon jungle or the Kalahari Desert and so on, or in Australia, the Aborigines survived, but in general, we have lived in class societies. Uh, and... But those class societies have taken many different forms uh, in different times, different parts of the world. For example, in the ancient world, ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, uh, and so on, the main form of production was slave production. And the key class division was between slave owners and slaves. In the Middle Ages in Europe, under feudalism, as it was called, um, the main form of production was farming and the main classes were lords who were the big landowners and the serfs or peasants who worked their land for them. Um, in the Middle Ages there was also uh, another class, a class that developed as the Middle Ages progressed and became more important. This was the, they were originally called burghers, townsmen, they became the business people or bourgeoisie of the towns. And gradually, this class, first gradually, then through a series of revolutions, um, noted most notably the English Revolution of 1642 to 47 and the French Revolution of 1789, this class overthrew uh, the feudal aristocracy and the monarchs based on, on them and established a new form of class society, capitalism. In this new form of society, there were now uh, two new main classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, as Marx called them, with the bourgeoisie as the ruling class. By bourgeoisie, Marx meant the owners of capital and the employers of wage labour. 
today we might more commonly call them the capitalists, or, phrase that's popularised recently, the 1%, because that's roughly what they are of, of society. Only 1% numerically, but the dominant, the ruling 1%. Uh, by proletariat, Marx meant that those who live by the sale of their labour power Important to note this, it's not about particular occupations, it's not about white collar versus blue collar, you don't have to be a manual worker. Teachers and nurses who live by the sale of their labour power are just as much workers as uh, miners or dockers or, 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 or bus drivers. Now the last point I want to make in this video is that um, there have always been, in all these different forms of class society, there have been intermediate layers. It's not as simple as there's just two classes. Uh, between slave owners and slaves, there were various kinds of uh, overseers and all sorts of other people controlled or serving the, the, the slave owners. Um, in the Middle Ages, there were multiple different layers of yeomen and gentry and knights and different ranks. Uh, in modern capitalist society, between the uh, bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the capitalists and the workers, there are small business people and there are complex layers of management um, uh, uh, and so on. But Marx, arg Marx's argument was that it is the uh, relations of production between the main classes that determines the basic structure of society. And it is between those main classes, in this case bourgeoisie and proletariat, and capitalists and workers, that the fundamental battles determining the, the, the future of society are fought out. In the next session uh, of this, uh, I will talk more about class and class struggle today. Thank you.